when AFC Wimbledon moved back to their spiritual home of Player Lane in 2021, it was a £32 million dream that made so much sense from a spiritual perspective, but it set the club back financially and since then it's been a tricky two years. They were relegated from League One in 21-22 under Mark Robinson and this year it's been a disappointing 21st place finish in League Two under Johnny Jackson. So how does the club rebuild? How do they come back up? And uh, uh, yeah, and what's the what's the solution for AFC Wimbledon? To discuss all this and more, I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Large from the excellent Nine Years podcast. How are you, Tom? I'm good, thank you, mate. I'm good. glad to be here, finally, on, a, on an actual League Two one, not sneaking in on the League One episode or anything like that. I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Buzzing to get you on, mate. Um, We should say this is also, if you're watching this on YouTube or on Spotify, do give us a subscribe because it helps us out um, an awful lot. And we're covering all 72 clubs across the EFL between mid-June and mid-July. There's already been a few uploaded, so go check those out. Um, Yeah, so coming back to that original question then, Tom, um, how do you reflect on the last couple of years and where do Wimbledon go from here? I, and I think it's a bit of a, a view of the minority, I personally think we played our best football under Mark Robinson. Um, that first half of that League One campaign, we were coming back from games where we were behind and we were playing actually sort of football that had a had a thought process or looked like anyway. Um, yeah. Last season, look, we went 10 unbeaten. That was really good. But at the same time, we left every game thinking, oh, what did we do right here for a start? Is there any mm-hmm. consistency in these performances? Not really. Um, and then obviously we... we really really struggled in the back in the back end of the season in 2023 so johnny jackson's had his challenges i think um and i think a lot of the fan base aren't happy uh, it's really the best way to put it uh, and i think now it's just a case of trying to build now craig cope has seemed to have stamped himself now on our recruitment process and we are signing well um, apparently he was one of the i think he was the lead in the signing of ali alhamadi and well mm. i think his, his stats say enough let alone you know watching him last season he was an absolute joy to watch and We've brought in some players, which I think, are now going to hopefully help sort of give him um, sort of better chances as well with Omar Bijil from Sutton, who I think for me is so far as the pick of the bunch for, for the transfers. And I think it's just going to be those first, you know, three, four, five games, which will then set us up for the season. If we win those games, Jackson stays in touch. But I do think it will be it. I think if it starts badly, we could see him go. Um, but... It depends whether the club want longevity and, you know, give him a, a chance to see it in. And, and he's very inexperienced. You know, he was playing football three years ago, four years ago. So, yeah, I think the biggest thing is just get, getting a good start to the season, getting the fans back on board uh, and seeing where it goes from there. Yeah, I um, I, I kind of see where you're coming from uh, when you mentioned uh, Mark Robinson, because there is part of me that think even though Wimbledon went on um, a 28 winless run and, uh, you know, obviously you've got to ask questions with that. There is part of me that wonders whether Wimbledon would have been in a better position had Mark Robinson stayed on, because I think he'd have brought a lot of um, a lot of attributes. But you, you mentioned um, you mentioned Craig Cope there. I'd also add in uh, Danny McLean, who I think is technical director. Um, do you think those off-field appointments have helped the club in terms of uh, how smoothly it's run? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, Danny McLean and Craig Cope have been massive, massive um, recruitments, I should say. Yeah, been, been amazing, and, and I think they've started to steer the ship in the right way off the pitch because we were in a, we weren't we were quite um, what's the word? Probably not amateur, it's a bit harsh, but we weren't at a league level off the pitch. But then again, mm. we've come through the leagues in nine years. Um, those things take time to come, especially when you haven't got money to throw at it. You know, we haven't got millions of pounds to throw at a whole brand new backroom staff uh, and that management structure. So, look, we've, we've done it in our own way. We, we've taken time, but I think we're really moving in the right way. And Craig Cope is, well, by, by going off of, you know, January, which I think he had he had a say in Ali. Uh, and and then, you know, look at the transfers so far this summer. And I, I mean, a lot of people seem a bit underwhelmed by, by the window, but I'm quite impressed. Um Again, I don't want to bang on about Omar Bujil, but I see, I've watched him for a couple no. of years, and he he is he's the centre forward that we needed. The big, he's just going to beat up defenders, give and then give space for our attackers to sort of you know do what they do best. I mean, Ali, he's, he is probably one of the best finishers in the league. I mm. think. Yeah, don't worry about uh, banging on about Omar Bujil with me, Tom, because I'm I'm a massive fan of his. I think he's um, pretty much the only um, the, the, he's got such a wide range of qualities. You're right to mention the physicality that he brings. I think he's a relentlessly hard worker as well. He grafts in the channels. His link-up play for someone mm. with those qualities at this level 
I think is really good. I think if if he was 23 rather than 28, I think he's someone that would be high league clubs will be looked at. But I think he's gone over under the radar a bit because of his age. Um, I think that's something Wimbledon have really benefited from. So if you can pair uh, all those qualities of, that Omar Bajil has with this ruthless goal scoring animal that is Ali Al Hamadi, that could be a really exciting combination, couldn't it? Yeah, and it also then poses the question, where does Josh Davison play? Because he's not a bad striker and he's shown when he, when he's in on goal. I mean, sometimes he can be a hit or miss with his finishing, but he had, but in this team, you didn't get many chances. Like he, he was working with scraps most of the season and he was worked into the ground. He was good at the start of the campaign and he played every minute and got injured. That man management is one of my issues with, with Jackson as he does seem that Alex Woodchild again played every minute coming in off a very busy summer last year. And we saw him, he was tired every game and he didn't look like he was his best. So hopefully now we've got, obviously, Ali, Josh, Omar, and obviously Zach Robinson returning from Dundee. That's four striking options, rotation, and I just think that's going to give us a chance. Um, yeah, I think I, I think our best Robinson partnership... Could, could really come into the mix, because I know in the back end of the year before, mm. he actually did really well under Mark Bowen, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, he did really well, and also had a good spell in Dundee. Uh, he went there, came back over the winter, played one game for us, or played like 10 minutes, and then went back, which was strange, but I think it was, if Ali hadn't come back, come or been arranged... Zach would have stayed on. Um, I think Zach's ready to step into the first team by things reports I've heard from his time in Dundee. Um, I think he's ready to be an option. There was some sort of issue between him and the management team. That's why he got sent out on loan because um, he signed a new deal and then went straight on loan, which was strange. But hopefully he can come back, show show the gaffer what he's about. Um, and, and that's four good striking options for League Two. And, and then just going back on what you mentioned about Omar Vigil, that's what we've missed is that they've been able to connect our attack and field together. We just don't seem to have that. But if we can have someone that's going to win the ball not necessarily like good back to goal. I don't. I don't want him to be a goal scorer. If he's if he's just winning the ball and playing it onto Ali or Josh or Zach, mm. that's all I need for me yeah. anyway. No, I'm not the manager, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's no, all no. I want to see. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think um, sometimes Wimbledon have had uh, in the last couple of years, Wimbledon have had the individuals who are capable of bringing the magic, but mm. they've not had someone who can bring that connects those players into play. Since Ollie Palmer left, it's felt like that's the thing that's been missing from Wimbledon. I, I, I think Palmer, I, I, he, I, I wasn't his biggest fan. Okay. I don't think he he offered enough um, at that level. And it's good. I'm happy you think to see he'd have him stayed up if, if Oli Palmer had stayed? No, no, no. no. And this is, this is my biggest debate like within Wimbledon fans, right? It okay. wasn't the fact he went. It was the fact we couldn't replace him. Because we brought Sam Cosgrove in. And look, when someone said to me, we're signing a six foot five strike from Birmingham, I went, oh, we're staying up, you know, go on a playoff run. Like, that's mm-hmm. ridiculous. I expected him to be so good. I remember we yeah. did him, he came on the show, I think, just as he signed. Uh, the pre-match show, and I remember seeing him. I was like, "Oh, he's getting his guy at all. Actually, he's going to win headers, and he couldn't." But it was again similar to when we had Joe Piggott. We used to lump the ball to him in the air. Joe Piggott is unbelievable with the ball at his feet, but we used mm. to play it to him in the air. He didn't win the header, and he got slated for it. So it was just yeah. I think we struggled it's sometimes. It's bird camp syndrome, right, isn't it? Um... Uh, mm. you, you might be a bit young for this, but Dennis Bergkamp was like um, at other clubs. He was sort of um, what's the word? Uh, pigeonholed as a target man because he was tall. When actually yeah. all the magic was was with his feet. So well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not comparing to Dennis yeah. Bergkamp. Well, I mean, but... Pickett's probably better, but uh, <laughs> Pickett, Pickett could play a pass. He could hit a free kick. I mean, he scored a lovely free kick in the lockdown season, I think. Um, and yeah, but we just never played to his feet or played to his strengths. And I think uh, he's one I'd love to come back. If we could get him back, that'd be great. But we've got four strikers now, so there's no need. Unless, obviously, Zach goes. But if Joe Piggott was to come back, he'd want to be a star man minutes. And obviously, everyone wants Lyle Taylor back. But again, yeah, four strikers. I just don't think we'll see any more attacking options unless they're sort of, you know, 18, 19, sending out on loan uh, from non-league. But yeah, so I, I think we're set up front now. Um, and I'd like us to maybe... Maybe a, maybe a centre-back and a right-back, I think, would be be my choices and, and another midfield option just for a bit of depth. Um, yeah, so, obviously, we signed James Tilly. What formation are you going to be recruiting for, do you think? Well, this is, this is where they're throwing a bit of a spanner in the work because, obviously, Josh Nerfield's a right mid, but I think can deputise at right back. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Uh, yeah. I think he played... So, he's played right mid in a 4-4-2 for Sutton, but, yeah. obviously, that role involves getting back quite a bit. Yeah. So, I imagine... I'm thinking he, he could be playing. emergency backup for alongside Ogundere for, for... I'm, I'm guessing Billet's going to be number one this year because he was so good Yeah, it'd be year. more attacking, I think, than Ogundere because yeah. Ogundere's a centre-back, right? Well, came yes. through as a centre-back, didn't he? Yeah, so. yeah. And sort of was pushed pushed into right back to kind of make into the first team and give us options. But I yeah. do, I, I I just can't see us not playing with two strikers. Although I also can because who knows what you know, Jackson Roulette. Or I think there's two strikers. Strange. I think there's a like there's there's probably a decent likelihood. Yeah, but we we just haven't seemed to play with two for a while. But 
I can't see with having Ali. Ali will his first name on the team sheet every day of the week. Um, and then I imagine I'm Moby Gill next to him, and then Ali and Josh will switch around. I, I guess, is, is, and then maybe a is full... there a world though, Tom, in which Johnny Jack because Johnny Jackson was a staunch three five two disciple at Charlton, yeah, and the first, back. <laughs> yeah, the first sort of two or three months of the season at, of last season at Wimbledon, he was three five two, and yes. then he felt like he had to change things around because he didn't have the personnel. When for we it. lost, when we lost to Sutton, but, that was sort of the, the yeah. Point. But but after another summer, I, is there a world in which he actually does go back to the three five two? I've said this. I have said this to people. I just. I, with with these new wingers we've got, obviously, um, I think McLean will be more of a squad option for now. Oh, yeah, of develops. Of um, but yeah. James Tilly can play out left, right? Is that correct? Yes. I thought he was a, no, yeah. No, he's left-footed. I think yeah. he's... He's, he's a attacking midfielder, but yeah, he can play across the front. So there's a chance that you get someone out on the left, Nerf or Biller out right wing-back. Or Jack Curry can play wing-back sort of thing into left mid because he's very... Jack Curry's very good going forward. Um, and when, and he was really good at the start of the season when we were playing five or five back into sort of three back sort of... Yeah, with wingers. Um and when he moved into a traditional left back, that's when he struggled a little bit. Um, so I think if we were to do like a three-five-two, it'd be Biller and Curry, sort of left wing back, left mid, right mid, sort of thing. A flat three of what, Harry Pell, maybe Alex Woodyard and Jake Reeves, and then a two strikers up top. Um, but then we'll need another centre back in that because we've obviously let Luke Jenkins go, which was a strange decision because I like when he stepped into the first team last year. Luke Jenkins was 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 class. Um, I think he did have a bit of a tough ride against Salford, obviously, because he came on at half time. As so did you know, six foot one hundred Matt Smith. So uh, <laughs> that was that was a tough chance uh, thing for him, and obviously that was a, a disappointing game. And I hope the decision of sort of him staying on wasn't made during that performance because I don't think he did that badly, um, all things considered. But yeah, so I I think it, I I could see us going three five two with obviously the sort of wide um, the wide recruitment we've made, but also maybe that sort of four one four one we seemed to play last year, or or a four back and two up front with sort of. Either it's, whether it's a triple two or like a diamond or flat four four two that sort of thing, but mm. that will be sort of I think how we'll line up. Um, and I'm excited for it. I'd like to see a play attack in football. When we when we played three five two, we did seem to be quite. It used to be more of a five three two where we played very defensive. Mm. Um, and, but again, I'd like to see Jack Curry and um, Husbilla's sort of attacking creativity uh, mm. shown more because they are very good at that. Uh, however, we might lose them sooner if if we do show that to the world. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think J- there's definitely going to be interest in Jack Curry this summer. I think with Husbiela, you've probably got a, champ- a better chance of keeping on for for an extra year. Um, yeah, because Jack Curry is the stats charts as well, so always like he I think he's got one of the best tackles or inception things like that. So that always doesn't work in your favour because because uh, <laughs> in the summer because I, I do think there was interest from from Bristol and I think we. I I don't know whether we should have sold him. I think that was a good sell on fee that was involved. Um, but I just yeah. I, I can just you get a million was... and a decent uh, decent percentage? I've always said if we can get a million pound for him, let him go because as much as he's very good, we the money I think is more important. And you could I think with Craig Cope's knowledge in on league, you could get someone in who could do a job. Maybe they're a bit older, but could do mm-hmm. a job that he'd do. And also people seem to like slately brown i think he did an absolute i think he did a quite fine job at left back like traditional left back not attacking in a, in a four rather in than a four, in a, yeah yeah in a four yeah, yeah. Okay. i think he I, I actually think he was better in a four at the start of the season not now jack curry's very much progressed as you'd expect of a young player but sure. i thought lee brown was absolutely solid he brought a real um sort of te- uh, team ethic with him yeah if there's any sort of like uh disagreement on the pitch he's straight in there sort of backing his players yeah. he's always in the referee Lionel's ears and stuff and that's what you that's what you want from your experienced pros it's what we mm. struggled with in league one and we've have seen that a little bit of a brotherhood forming where you see nick zanev uh paul kalambay and sort of lee brown any sort of issue on the pitch they're straight into it sort of backing their teammate mm. and you want to see that because you want your players to play for each other and then play for the manager then play for the fans that's what you want sort of that if they play for each other, they'll play better because, you know, you've got more on the line, I feel like. Yeah, and uh, I suppose that, that sounds like that trio could be really important in terms of the dressing room because um, I watched um, some of the fans' forum, which was certainly a lively conversation, wasn't it? Yes. And um, I think one of the things people raised was that um, certain uh, certain individuals in the squad... Um, that weren't necessarily behaving as you'd have hoped at certain moments. Uh, mm. I'm not going to go into too many details, yeah. but you know, there's sort of a sense of a bit of a lax, a bit of a you know, not not treating things properly. And I suppose that core of players could have a really important role in terms of just straightening things out. Massively. Um, I remember we had Lee on the show at the start of the season, and when we were playing well, you know, we were near the playoffs, which was strange. I was like, wow, this is this is new uh, after six years of you know looking over our shoulders in, in League One. Um, 
And he said it's the best dressing room we've been in. Like it was a dressing room that reminded him when he was being promoted last. And and that carried on. And then all of a sudden, you know, things turn. I think our season was defined by the two Sutton games, which we lost to them both, unfortunately, uh, which is never never a happy game to go to. Um, but yeah, and, and during that time, there was a re- that ten on game on beating. There was a really really good feel around the squad. Uh, and then it just seemed to sour. And then performances carried on dropping. And unfortunately, the time where you need to really players need to step up is when you're losing and you know dropping down the table. We should never ever have finished twenty first. Uh, mm. I I'm, in, in I'm terms strongly of the fact we've got a strong team. That that I, I completely agree with you, Tom. I think if you go through the individual players that you had at different stages last season, there were some players who didn't play for the full campaign and other things like that. But in terms of the, the players that you had, I think it was a top half squad. So well, that, finish... that. It, was a play, it was a playoff squad and I'll I'll stand by that. I didn't think we would finish playoffs. I said twelfth would have been happy I'm happy with twelfth. Yeah. God, the twenty first is nowhere near it. No, and the fact we were actually starting to look over our shoulders with eight games to go, because mm-hmm. there was a genuine sense of worry. Um it is remarkable. If and I, I'm, I'm as as negative as this is. If we dropped out of the league, we would never get back in again. I don't think. I really don't think the the, the strength in in Lee in the national league with your Chesterfields and stuff. I just don't think we'd have got back in again. Um, and I, I personally, I, I think Jackson's lucky to keep his job. I do think that because it was at times it was very negative on the pitch, mm. and also for a fan owned club, a lot of there was a lot of chance at the end of games and stuff being like we want Jackson out and. People aren't wrong. Um, the football was was quite poor at times, and we were saved by moments. Obviously, Asal was one of our leading goal scorers and left in January. Riley Towler, Pompey have got themselves a hell of a player. Mm. He is a serious player, and you know he could play defensive mid, he could play centre back. And when we had him, Towler, and Zanev as as that sort of trio, goalkeeper and centre backs, that's when we were keeping clean sheets and things like that. And I think when you've got a, when your backline and goalkeeper have got that level of trust together, it really helps out. And I think we've seen that issue when we started conceding goals. There was a lot, and the change we changed our centre backs quite a lot, mm. and that's when Nick Zanner started to fall off in the season. And I, I, I'm a, I think everyone knows I'm a massive Nick Zanner fan. I, I do think he's a good keeper. I think he's a league top league two keeper personally. I, I, I dare say that's not a um, uniformly popular opinion. No, that. no, no. I'm very much in the minority there. I do think he gets made a scapegoat um, quite a lot of the times. I mean, he's had his mistakes. I'm not going to say no. When he double-kicked the ball for, for Fleetwood in League One, that was unexcusable. Um, sometimes his distribution is not great, but he's a very good shot stopper and he's a good penalty mm. saver as well. And I, and, yeah. and he's also been with us for a while. You know what you're getting with him. He will have good games. He will have good games. He'll have the odd poor, uh, poor game. But he's a League Two player. Everyone, <laughs> no, if you know, if they're playing ten out of ten every week, they'd be in the Prem. Like they wouldn't be in League Two. So they're going to have games where they're not. They're not amazing. Um, whether we and also having a permanent keeper is just such a nice thing to have because they can't get recalled for a start. And but then you can get a better quality of goalkeeper in the lane market sometimes. Oh, oh, one million percent. You look at the loans we've had. Aaron Ramsdale, you know, pff, what keeper? Mm. Joe Day, I really, enjoy, I really like Joe Day. But um, Nathan Trot as well, who I take back in a heart. Um, promotion Caesar Keller Roos as well. Oh god, what a keeper! What a keeper! He was so good. And again, the, the loan market is something you can definitely. Um, and, and, and really, really um, capitalise on. But you look at our season this year, Paris Macomb were recalled and, and sent to a certain side. Um, Riley Tower recalled and sold to Portsmouth. Who else was recalled? Um, Nathan Young Coombs recalled. It's just that absolutely ruined our season because you lose three very, very integral players. Nathan Young Coombs on his day, I mean, when he came back, he was clearly still injured because he wasn't kind of showing yeah, the Yeah, he did struggle with injuries, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. Went against Sutton, he kind of just strolled around and you thought, this isn't this isn't the M1C we know. Because against Crawley, oh my... What? He was he was just... He was absolutely relentless up top. Him and Ali would have been... Oh, God, I don't want to think about it. It would have been so good. And obviously, Ayub Asal, great player. So obviously, the release clause met. Riley Towler. How much uh, did you get for Rat Asal in the end? My understanding is between one and one and a half million, I think, was the release clause. Okay. Sort of middle ground there, which I'm happy with. Um, I think, obviously, we could have sold him for more, but we probably wouldn't have had... He wouldn't have signed a new deal, I'm guessing, if he didn't have a release clause. So, I'm mm-hmm. happy to see him this season. Um, I, I was a bit upset in the conduct in which he held himself with, not playing and stuff, because he was mm-hmm. had a virus or something. Uh, but, you know, I don't know what, I, I'm assuming he wasn't unwell, because um, there was always rumours about him leaving, whether that was to a, to a championship team, League One team. Um and yeah, it's just, it was a shame to see him go out that way because I think he would have been been really good and it was just not a showing of his character because he was a real real grafter for the team and really tried hard. And it was good to see him sort of um, build on and him and Rudoni sort of, those two boys come through the academy and, and go on well. And I don't think we've got, I think obviously Morgan Williams is our next one like that and he signed a pro deal um, obviously as well yeah. with Paris. What's Lockett his potential and, like, do you reckon? 
from what I've heard, I've not actually seen too much of him. I know a few people that have watched him in the um, the youth games and said there was better than Alfie Bendel, and everyone knows the sort of rating that Alfie Bendel's got. So, yeah, I, I, he, he's got a high ceiling, apparently. Uh, and Aaron Sassu as well. Oh, sorry, where does, um, where does Morgan Williams play? Attack, uh, a central attacking midfielder, so sort central of, midfielder. Okay. I think in the 10 sort of thing. Um, and then, again, I, I, I don't want to say anything because I've not seen him play, uh, sure. apart from a few minutes sort of an eye follow, I think. Uh, what about Bendel, games. though, uh, Tom? You mentioned Alfie Bendel. And... I, just, I feel sorry for that. I think we've I think we've done what we did to Anthony Hartigan, which was really, really hype him up into a player that's got potential but isn't there yet. I actually felt like feel like you've done the opposite to what you did with Anthony Hartigan because I think Anthony Hartigan, when he was very young, he oh God, he was a lot of games mm. straight away. Whereas Alfie Bendel, oh, I meant think... around the hype, sorry, not the minutes hype sort of thing. So he's yeah, been, no, I know, I know, but I'm just looking at this from flipping this in into another sense. Like I, I, I know where you're coming from, but I look okay. at it and Alfie Bendel got loaned out to National League South. Yes, um, and I, I just sort of feel like. Um, you want if you want to bring players into the fold, like mm-hmm. last season was a season where you were pretty much mid table for much of it. Would it would last season have been a good time to bring Alfie Bendel into the equation? Yes and no, in theory, yeah. But he's only he's only eighteen. He turned eighteen in January. There's no need for him to be playing men's football right now because there's no, we're not we're not short for players. And he, when he came on, he wasn't that good that he sort of stood out for everyone else. So I just personally think if we could send him out on loan or play him 21s football, well, I don't think they have 21s actually, but sort of playing that football that way he's getting regular minutes every week. There's less pressure in a team that, it was a pretty toxic environment at Plough Lane, especially when we were losing. There was a lot of booze and stuff. And as an 18 year old, you don't want to be involved in that. It's going to be at hard. The same get time, to at the same time, if if you get an 18 year old that be, develops so well that they become uh, the heartbeat of the team or become mm. develops at an extremely high, um, a high rate, if you like, um, then when they're if they do that when they're 18 all of a sudden their value uh skyrockets oh of course yeah. if, you, if they become a if they become a first team player when they're 20 or 21 yeah. the value isn't quite there because the, yeah. the biggest clubs don't really have that same interest in 20 they they'll be looking in a different um area so i i think sometimes there can be something to be said for being very brave oh, oh no 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 i i completely agree i i'm here for like I, I, Ubisoft was in the team from a very young age so was really but I just don't think there's like, there's no need for it. We'll, I, if we get a fee for him, we get a fee for him. But we got him. On, I think we got him on a free. So regardless, it's sort of. I think he's on. Oh, I thought he came through the academy. No, no, no. He he came, apparently he came to us and said, "I want to play for you," and sort of made the move. To, and then we gave him a trial. And then he that that, that could be utter rubbish, by the way. But that's what I've heard. So <laughs> okay. and that's not from the club. Either. That's just from like random <laughs> like social media and stuff. But apparently, <laughs> apparently it's correct. But I don't know. Um, apparently, apparently he didn't come for our academy. He was. In maybe a Premier League academy again. I don't know much about the lad, but okay. so he was in another academy. Came to us, and then we sort of um, we took him on. And and look, apparently he's very good. But Anthony Harskin was also meant, tipped to be much better than he was, and we put him in so early, gave him so many minutes. He used to get quite a lot of abuse because he was he was meant to be like our first million pound player. Or something like that. He should have really kind of gone on to bigger things. And unfortunately, he's not. I think he's at Mansfield now, which had a back operation yeah. uh, or shoulder operation, and. I feel really sorry for him because he's a local lad, came in for our academy. Like he's a similar boat to Will Nightingale in terms of been here for years, and I would have liked to see him go and do big things or do good things for us. But I don't think we played him in the right position, uh, and I'm worried that we do the same to Bendel. Let us find a position for him in the youth teams or on loan. Let him get minutes. Let him sort of toughen up a bit. Bring him into the team. If, even he's if it'll be it'll be 19 in the second half of next season. If we sent him out, if we sent him on a full loan last year, first six months this year, then you can bring him into the team. You know what I mean? Like really get, you him out again it. this year. Yeah, oh, we're one million percent, one million percent. I'd learn him out again. I just don't, I just for half a season, I think. Just, I don't, I, there's no point in him sitting around on the bench like as he has done. He's not going to get anything from that apart from maybe you know, that team room atmosphere, sort of that experience from being around a squad. But I just don't think that's to be beneficial to him. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, how yeah, important... he'll, he'll probably score 30 goals next year from midfield. <laughs> how important is Paul Kalambay going to be, uh, to, to the Dons next year? Massively, uh, I think if we, uh, but only if we can get a settled back line, if we can get a centre back partnership, him and maybe Alex Pierce, I think works well. If we can get them regularly playing together, um, then we're fine. Or if it's a back three, that those back three sort of being settled, um, is, is the most important thing. He is very good, however, he does have the odd mistake in him. Sometimes he'll slice the ball and he's clearing it and things like that, and that can be frustrating. Um, but I, I like him. Uh, again, he's another academy boy. So you, I think he, he will, if they're academy boys, they always get a little extra rate and an extra a plus one out of ten. If they're, I think always, um, they, they they just sort of something hits different about them because they're yours. 
Mm. But I think he can learn from a lot from Alex Pierce, and then he can also be sort of a guiding light for our younger players coming through. So and look, I've I've done this. I've come from the youth team and I've stepped into the team. And I think he's getting better season on season. Um, now being the league too, I think it's better as well. I think he's only, I think he's mid-20s now. So he can't, he's getting on to some yeah. more experience now. He's been um, around for a while, hasn't he now? Yeah, let me have a look quickly. Come by. Is... I'm sure he came through in the sort of late 2010s. Yeah, oh, he's 23. 23. I'm really doing dirty there. Yeah, he's 23. So look, he's still very young for a centre-back. Alex Pierce is, what, 33 now? So if he, if he goes, has the same longevity of a career as Alex Pierce, you know, going on for 10 years. So, look, get him. But then again, he feels like he's been someone that's been around for so, so long. So, mm. I, that's only a good sign because he must be, he's a decent player. If he's not, because he wouldn't be being picked if he wasn't. So, him, Alex Pierce, that would be my probably, unless we sign, unless we sign a low knee centre back or uh, get someone on a permanent, that as, as, as current things stand, would be um, my, my sort of my first choice. And, and them two getting off to a good start and building that connection is so, so vital. Yeah, well, hopefully they can do that. Oh, uh, talk to me about uh, about Haspila, Tom, because I think, um, oh, yeah, I, yeah I, I think he's a really exciting talent. Ah, and he also he, he just cuts, he runs forward, cuts in and shoots like like Iron mm. Robin. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> cuts in from the right yeah. and just yeah, and, and he's nearly scored some nice goals last year. As well. Yeah, no, I, I was there for one of them actually, where he just just cut yeah, and yeah. Just died, but it looked really yeah. impressive. And we're in the south stand as well. I thought he'd gone in. I was going mental, and I realised it missed. It was like. Yeah, he's been really good, and he's he's really showing his he's very good defensively as well. Um, yeah. And he's he, I think he's learning the game. He's got a leap on him as well. Yeah, um, he's not he's I, not I, particularly I, tall, but he can jump. I remember um, uh, Mick Dor saying something like, uh, he, "He he jumps like he's checking uh, he's checking the attic. <laughs> he's yeah. checking checking for out in the attic or whatever." He's, I can't yeah. remember what they call. He's got such a, a leap on him, and that paired with his he's fast. He can put a tackle mm-hmm. in, and he can shoot like. He, 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 him and Jack Curry are definitely more traditional wing backs, I think, rather than full backs. But the fact they can play there is even is more helpful as well. So mm. they're both versatile. Uh, but yeah, Huss steps into the team with zero issues. Like you'd think of him playing for, for three or four seasons with us when he stepped in. Uh, everyone was really impressed. Uh, and and they've, they've both got really high ceilings, but hopefully we'll, we'll see some of that. We'll see some of those sort of uh, those, those potential matches hopefully with us and then they'll move on, I imagine. I don't think we keep them, sadly, especially not with the, the, the debt and things like that. We, we I think you that. might keep. I think you might keep us another year. Oh I yeah, think. yeah. No, sorry, fill out another year, one million percent. Curry, we might lose in the window. Um, I really mm. hope not because I think it'd be good to have him sort of build him in, um, rather than relying on. I think we've just got Lee Brown as left back options at the moment. So, yeah, but then you yeah. can you can recruit maybe. Oh yeah, loan or a loanee. Because how many? This is bad. I should know this, but how many loans can you have in a season? Is it like six? I think it is six. Yeah, and you and can have five, five in the team sheet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, we had uh, we brought Sam Pearson in last year, so he's about loans, and I thought he was really good. So I'd like to see him come back if we're looking at playing wide players, because he was so fast. So oh, really? fast. Yeah, yeah. Some people didn't like him, but he was one of our best attacking players last year. But obviously, Ali is never included in that question because he is the greatest. Mm. Um, but yeah, he was one of our other better you know, sort of attacking options, which was good. Yeah, and and, and that's that's interesting. It, feel, it, it feels weird having this conversation, Tom, because we can sort of talk about so many individual players yes. where you're saying, yeah, last year they were really exciting to watch and, you know, really, and yet Wimbledon, the collective wasn't exciting to watch. So I they weren't, and I was at every home game. <laughs> yeah. And so, so something's wrong there. I think when, when, you, when there's that um, sort of uh, gap between the individual performance and collective performance. Yeah. I, it's just strange. We do. And I've said this for a while, like within sort of my friends and stuff, we just don't seem to be able to link our different sort of you know, defence midfield attack very well. There's no fluidity in the, as you go forward. And it, it's really hard to put your finger on it. When you watch it, you kind of understand. But the ball goes into the middle and we just never seem to get it. And there's no, there seems to be no method of getting the ball from goal. Sorry, just, just talk me through that again, Tom. So when it's the ball really, goes it's, it's a weird like, or... it, At all. Sort of building it, forward. Okay. It is... Like under Robbo, and I'm a big Robbo fan, so I'll probably, surely, probably slightly blue and yellow glasses, Robbo, because I did like. No, him. I, I, I actually yeah. agree with you on Robbo. But I think we played really... some incredible football. We were playing like triangle, like like different triangles. We had made forward, and there was clear, clear thought process. I just don't see it at the moment. Something's something's missing, and it's one of those things you know you can't put your finger on it, but you can see it when you watch it. Because mm. I've watched them every week. You kind of there's these similarities you pick up, and it's just there is no, there's no continuance in our performances mm. every single week it's the same but, but different it's just bitty build-up that isn't necessarily great it seems to be get the ball in the middle to Ali let him run cut in and shoot yeah. and that's not going to cut it every game 
No. Ali's going to get... There'll be games where Ali doesn't play well. The lad's 21. He might be generational, but he's young. Yeah. Um, and teams and can double up on him. Yeah, teams... Like, we saw that with Josh Davidson quite a lot. And that was... Whilst Carl Hodlin was not the greatest impact player, he did when he came on against Colchester. Remember, Colchester away, he came on and Josh went from him, two defenders on him to one. And he, and he got the ball more and, and it really helped him. And against a home game, they all blend into one. It was all poor. Uh, <laughs> they, they, he just had everyone on him. And he's not a target man for a start. I think he's, I think he's six foot. So he's not the tallest. He's tall, but not the tallest sort of player on the pitch. But he's not built for that. He's built, play the ball to him. Josh Davison is so deceivably fast. He is unbelievably fast. He gets past players so easily, but we don't play to that. We play it to him in the air. He loses the ball and everyone moans. But it's like, yeah, that, that's, that's, weird, that's the thing I've seen a couple of times when, when Josh Davison's been playing up top and Wimbledon have gone long to him. And it's like he's just not that good in the air. No, I he's don't. not. I don't, I don't think he is either. And that's no slate on him because he's so good getting in behind. If the ball goes over the top onto him, we saw against Harrogate. We were, I mean, that was, we won, but that was a horrendous, we did not deserve to win that game. But it's two all. Nick Zanna plays his ball over the top. Josh Davison runs in. Oh, what a finish. Side netting. But, but that's what he's good for. It's over the top. But you lump the ball to him. He's, to be fair, he's a big lad. Like he's fit, he's built. But his his best attribute is getting the ball. Sort of, you see him. He puts his shoulders out a little bit and just like he's almost like bullying the china shop. He just pushes through defenders and gets in on goal. Sometimes he's way with his shot. But I don't mind that. He's a young. He's 22, 23. Absolutely fine if he misses the odd shot. But it's more you get scrutinised more when you don't get as many chances and you're also missing headers. But yeah, you know, he shouldn't be winning those headers because he's not a target man. And that is a very Wimbledon sort of Wimbledon issue. Is we think every striker we get should be a target man, and that obviously not every striker on the planet's a target man. <laughs> yeah, for we sure. started playing Ali out wide. Well, that would have yeah. been a disaster if we made Ali a left winger. That would have been a disaster. I'm mm. so glad he ended up playing up front because he's very good. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think uh, with all these conversations, it's difficult to, invo- uh, to avoid talking about uh, about Johnny Jackson. Um, mm. I um. I, I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on him, actually, because obviously as a neutral sort of thing. Sure. Um, I feel like with Johnny Jackson, something just feels a little bit off. He doesn't feel to me like a Wimbledon manager. And I'm sure if he was watching this, he would say, what evidence have you got for that? What, you know, what's the... Yeah, he um, seems like a stand-up bloke as well, call... Sorry, say that again. He seems like a stand-up bloke as well. Like, he seems nice. Sort of thing, like if he had a beer yeah. and he'd be great. And that's what makes yeah. it harder because he doesn't seem like he's not trying. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I know. Um, but I also feel like there's something when he's on the. I, I've seen him on the uh, the touchline a few times, and there's mm. something a little bit sulky, I think, as well. Yeah, and, and then... interviews. He's just like, even if you don't feel it, come out of the cameras blaze and be like, look, um, we put our hands up, we didn't do things right, and look, but he's he's, he's slouch, slouch back like like that. Like, just show a bit of passion, and the pl- mm. fans will get inside. All we care about is the players and, and management team caring, really caring for the club. You saw that, Robbo. You know for a fact Mark Robinson cared about this club. Neil Ardley mm-hmm. cared about the club. Again, is it maybe because Jackson's our first, bar Terry Bowen, but that doesn't, doesn't really count because obviously he was like seven games um, at interim. But every other person we've had, bar Jackson, has been our oh, ex-Wimbledon, so they've had that connection. I think that's a red herring, to be honest, Tom. I think that um, even if you don't have a prior... Um, Association with Wimbledon, I still think you've got an obligation. Oh, any club, any, cl- any club, you should be buying into that team, and but you especially should be... a, a fan owned club that was mm-hmm. rebuilt by the supporters. Yeah. You've got to be able to buy into the fabric of the football club. And um, I hope Johnny Jackson um, proves me wrong. And, Look, and I'll get we... behind any management we have. I, mm-hmm. I I will stand by any management we have because at the end of the day, I'm not making decisions on who's in charge, so I can't, you know. Mm-hmm. He might have been the only person to apply. We don't we don't know who applies and stuff like that. Because I, I'm not gonna lie to you, we're not we're not that an attractive club to manage. We aren't. We're gonna have a very we're probably the smallest budget or one of the smallest budgets in the division. You've got very limited resources and, and sort of whilst Plough Lane is a fantastic facility, our training ground is not up to scratch, I don't think. And there's been a lot of complaints about that, and I think we're getting work into that. Um but again, you've got a loyal fan base who who we were selling still, you know, seven and a half, we were selling like 75%, 80% of capacity when we were 28 games without a win last season in League One and they carried on this season we've sold four and a half thousand season tickets so the fans are, the fans are staying but my issue is if Jackson stays in charge and we're losing I don't know how many people will stay on I will because I'm a sucker and I've got I need something to do on Saturday so 
I I feel like you, you sell yourself you sell yourselves a little bit short because I think I, I agree. I think Wimbledon have um, have got a lot of challenges. I think this is a difficult um, period in the Wimbledon trajectory, and I don't want to underestimate that. I actually have a lot of um, sort of sympathy for the challenges that Jan Jackson has, has taken on because mm. you look at it. First of all, twenty eight game lo- um, winless streak uh, felt like a losing streak. It was winless streak. Um, and uh, of course, what I mentioned at the top of the show, the tw- thirty-two million pound purchase of New Player Lane, um, that's going to take a hit in terms mm. of what the club's able to do, especially with no like big millionaire behind the scenes to go. Yeah, got that don't worry, sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so I think it's a really difficult time from from that point of view. But I think that the stadium, I think, is a huge attraction. Beautiful. Um, that's, that's that's why we sign players, though, because I remember I spoke to Aaron Presley when we got him on loan. And he had he had options from around around the leagues, uh, and he yeah. went he went yeah. I walked in. Robbo had uh, a Presley nine or Presley, I think it was nineteen shirt on the wall. Mm. Showed me the stadium, and the stadium's what sold it. And I think one of the other players mentioned in one of their recent interviews that they saw the stadium and went yeah, I want to play here. Yeah, because because like for example, I mean we I think as football fans we love the uh, traditional grounds, and I think there's definitely a place for that. But then I've been to Grimsby, for example, where the toilet oh, first game of season. Ah. Have, have you ever been to the toilets in Grimsby? No, no, I'm going first game of the season. Yeah, they're, they're awful. So, oh, so, <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't want to make sure you go in one of the pubs beforehand. Um, but it, it, that's that's the sort of thing where it's like the facilities at Wimbledon are really good because it's a modern stadium, and I think in lots of ways that's an attraction. I think the story of the club as well is an attraction to to people. Um, but I think it's just a time at the moment where the club's just coming through a bit of a rough patch. And it's about, um, you know, can, can they rebuild, I guess? Yeah, and I think that's the important thing. I, I'd said for a while, as long as we're in the league, I'm happy. I mean, that championship five-year plan, everyone goes on, oh, like, oh, just forget about it, OK? They said it would be in championship five years. We're not. Like, just move on from it. You know what I mean? Like, so what? I, I, I personally quite enjoy League Two football. It's cheaper. Um, you know, you go all around the country. I went to Hartlepool for a nil-nil. That was horrendous, by the way. Three and a half hours on a hot train. No, thank you. Do it again this year. Yeah, oh, season, can't, can I? Yeah. Yeah, it was. That was really good. It was really good, though. And that's the thing for me. And I think a lot of Wimbledon fans, a lot of football fans in general, like it's the meeting your mates in the cafe for, 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 for a fry up, getting the train to some God knows what place around the country, watching your team probably lose, then coming home on the same train, coming home and you're home by like 11 o'clock usually and getting to bed. And that's a good day out. The football's usually the worst part. Like Jill and them, oh, love Jill and them away. What a day. But to be fair, Jill's actually having a good time actually for them. So happy to see that. Uh, they'll be they'll be top end next year. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. what football's about. It's not about like if if you want to watch, you know, quality football week in week out, go Fulham if you're local. Go Chelsea. You know what I mean? If you're in London, go watch City. Go watch United. Mm. Wimbledon's not about that. Wimbledon's about having a good time with your mates usually, and you know, getting behind the story. And I think the people that enjoy it most, the people that have kind of bought into that story of you know, when we win, it's big. Like it's a big. And we've, we're so used to not winning as well. Like I'm so used to going to games. Think, oh, we lost 2 now. Oh, well, I remember leaving Arsenal Stadium, losing 3 0, thinking this is the best night of my life. It's unbelievable. It was, quite, it was just so good. And yeah. that's what I think football, again, it's not just obviously not just me, if millions of football fans think the same. It, it's just that aspect of going watching live football and act, actually supporting your team. I could, could not imagine watching my team on telly every week. <laughs> no, thank you. Mm. Yeah, it's just, it's not the same, is it? We don't yeah. connect with things through us, through no, a screen. No, no. We, we really connect with things in, in person. And um, yeah, uh, I, I think that's um, that's the thing, really. For for, for work. how far do you uh, how how much work do you think needs to be done for Wimbledon to get to a stage where there is some sort of financial stability off the back of? Because uh, I I do feel like that's a significant part of mm, this. That is the biggest thing. It's when the debt's paid off. I think it's it was about ten million pound debt. I think, and mm. we've, we've got plans in place. I, unfortunately, again, as a journalist, I should know all these on the back of my hand, but I don't. Uh, to be fair, I've always found Wimbledon, I go watch the games and kind of stay away from the politics of it all because it can get quite... Like, you, you see the Facebook groups and stuff. If you're a part of them, I do apologise because they are appalling sometimes. Um, but there's all those sort of politics. Findings. But I think there's plans in place that I've got faith in the club because they're, they're the people that it means the most to mm. because they're the people that built the club from the, from the floor up and they're not going to let that club... They're not going to let the club go in, in any way. Mm. So that's fine. Yeah. Um, there's plans in place. It will take a while. Um, I recently, and this isn't to plug my own stuff, it was just a, a project. Okay. Go for it. I did a podcast series on fan ownership with Wimbledon. I spoke to Mark Jones and Chris Stewart. 
Uh, I spoke to Alistair, who's an Exeter fan, and also Nick Hawker, who is an Exeter. And, yeah. board, and then unfortunately, um, I didn't really, I, I managed to get a Newport fan, but none of their board would speak to me. So I just did like a little five minutes episode of them, just got their history and things and how they're fan owned. But speaking to Exeter, they were saying that their stadium took, it's a lovely stadium, by the way, it took 20 years to get everything in place. We've been at Plough Lane for what, 20, the COVID season, wasn't it? So two seasons now, three seasons? Two seasons with fans, one without. So yeah, three yeah. seasons. Yeah, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be, you know, the place isn't gonna be finished in that time. It's gonna take a while. We've got potential developments, you know. There's look, we're thinking there's gym being built there now and things like that, and that's what we need to do to then develop the off off the pitch. We need to build ourselves up to be a, run like a professional league club, whether that's fan owned or not. That's not for me to say. I don't mind either way. In all honesty, really, I, I'm, I'm, it, I was I was a staunch seller out massively. I wanted us to sell immediately. I said this is ridiculous, it's not working. I've gone a little bit full circle. Do you think that there's... um, I've got a question, Tom. Do you think it's the older generation that are typically more in favour of being fan-owned and the younger generation who are more open-minded about external investment? Yes. I mean, my um, obviously, my dad is a massive woman fan. That's why I have these beautiful shirts. Wonderful. It's the best thing to come (laughs) come through the the family heritage line. Um, He's a massive woman fan. And it's interesting to see it from his point of view as well. Um, because obviously he went through all the problems at Sellers Park. He went through, you know, football clubs stop. I could not even fathom the day knowing that Wimbledon would be stolen from me. That would be like that. Wimbledon is, and this is awful to say, but it's almost like a part. It's a part of my proper part of my life now. Like match days are like that's just standard. Saturdays Wimbledon, and it's such a big thing. And I could not imagine having that taken away from you because you know where would I? Where would I go in sport? I would, I would, Fulham ain't gonna hit the same. Chelsea ain't gonna hit the same. Charlton? No, that does not. It, that Wimbledon are my club, and I could not. And for someone to even have the thought of it taken away from them again, I, I completely get why they'd be in favour of fan ownership. And look, if we can stay in the leagues, I'm, I'm fine. If we can stay in the league, maybe I think League One would be a fair point for us. Mm. I think with the football goals now, Championship's a bit of a no go, I think. I don't think so, we'll get so, yeah, I, I think this, this is a really interesting point. I think if I was to offer my two pennies on it, and um, it would be that if you do go, I can see the benefit of external investment if you want oh, to mass, I can push, see, yeah, yeah. push towards the next level. But what I think is really important is that, um, and I think this is what would happen if, if the club did go down this route, would be that someone started off with a really small stake, kind of uh, ingrained, is ingrained the right word, sort of steeped themselves into the, mm. the tradition and the fabric of the club, yeah. proved themselves to be reliable people on the board, then took a slightly bigger stake and then got slightly more connected to the club. So by the time they were ready to take, um, whether it be you know a, an even bigger stake, there would be at a point where they've proven themselves to be a reliable person. Whereas yeah, I don't think, I have no you know, no way the club will do this. The idea of a wham, bam, thank you, man, where it's like someone just has 100% stake straight away. It's no, just, that wouldn't know. happen. To be fair, they have got, there is shares open to be sold and no one's buying them. So there needs to be interest in us. But mm. then, and again, I go back to the podcast. I don't want to plug it. It's just genuinely interesting. Okay, chat. Yeah, I do yeah, it on sure. the pre-match show all the time and they, they absolutely mock me for it because I'm there like oh again but I obviously speaking to Mark Jones and he was saying obviously Gillingham are an exciting prospect because they're the only club in Kent whereas you look at us we have got such a tiny catchment area you look around and also our ground is a very you know that's a, a, an expensive piece of land they sell it they'd make the serious money you know what I mean like if someone was to sell our ground and move us to by the, by the M25 or that sort of way, move us out of London. On, on the flip side to that, though, Tom, do you think there's there's more of an appetite for football in that part of London than maybe there, there is? is? But there's more options, though, is the problem. So say, for example, yeah. if women are away, oh, I can go to Charlton, or I can go to Leighton Orient, or I can go to Sutton, or I can go to Hampton and Richmond. Is, is, is sort of, there's a, a plethora of options for all, all financial sort of levels. So if you want to watch your top-level football, you can watch your Chelsea's, your Fulham's. Um, even your West Ham's, if you look further out, sort of into London. Yeah. But, but then you'll London. get you'll get Chelsea fans that might pop down to Wimbledon. This is, this is a lot of our fan base as well. Like I, I, I've brought my mates down. Like if I've got a spare season ticket, I go, come on, boys, then you come, then you come, come watch some real football. You sound like you're talking to a dog there. Yeah, no, that's bad. Didn't <laughs> come, on, <boy. laughs> yeah. come, on, come on, lads, come watch some real football. Um, and then I get bullied for it after when we uh, when we inevitably look. I think I took my mate to a three 0 drubbing of Fleetwood, and that was not a five Fleetwood. Sorry, and that was uh, that was uh, that's lived forever. We, we, then, we then beat West Ham three uh, one, was it or? Four, four, three, well, you eight. played them. You, there was a season where you played them twice in the cup. Yeah, I mean, we, the first one didn't count. The second one really good because uh, <laughs> 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 um, I actually didn't go to that game as well. And it's something I, 
I fuming about. It. I watched it at my best mate. He, he's a West Ham fan. So I watched it at his house. You played them in the first game. You played them with ten. You held them out with ten. Yeah, minutes. Robert Donald got sent off, and it was never a sending off. Um, yeah. But we did. We actually did really well in that game. Uh, Pink, mm. Pink Pickett scored or had a had a header saved early on. I was thinking, hang on a minute, <laughs> we're in this. I yeah. after this, this the FA Cup when we beat them. I genuinely watched the most anti-football I'd ever seen in my life against Fleetwood. And I thought, it's going to be 50. This is going to be double figures. This is going to be genuinely embarrassing. And all of a sudden, the players went, no, nah, we're on camera now. So we'll actually start playing properly. And then, yeah, we played 4 4 2, we played out from the was back. It a great escape season. Yes. Yeah, Wally Downs. So that was um, that was a huge moment in terms oh, of the. Because I, I think that it was. generated momentum for us. Yeah, because I remember, I think, I want to say you lost 2 0 at home to Burton. And then um, you went to Warsaw, I think it was. And I was actually at this game. And I think you won. Might have won one nil at Warsaw. Um and uh, oh was it Steve Set I think Steve Seddon scored. And um and then I think from then on you just went yeah. on this incredible. And there was, a, there was a it was a Steve Seddon goal. It was against Luton, I think the Steve Seddon goal. Do you remember the head? No, I, th- I think goal. Steve Seddon might have scored. Oh, he said I probably think... scored a couple. He was really, he was on his first trip. He he was he was with us twice, I think, Seddon. First yeah. time he was really good. Second time he didn't live up to it, unfortunately. Yeah. Um but that Luton game, the great escape, that was the one that sort of um sealed us safe and it was in, it was an Aaron Ramsdale masterclass mm. and also we just I remember he, 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 the save where he went over and he just put his hand up bang you're like hang on a minute where's that coming from I thought that was out wow. I thought he was in so I thought he's gone straight in and yeah and that was sort of there was almost this sort of cloud over the club where it was just like this is, this is happening and there was mm. no doubt sort of we went into games I was thinking we're going to win this and yeah. we had no reason to win it and then we ended up safe and oh Incredible. Mm. I had to work the last game of the season. I was fuming. Bradford 0 0. I think we had to hold out. If we, we drew, we stayed up and we did. My yeah. mates relented. It was carnage. It was really, really good. Awful game of football, but really good at the mm. time. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think this does kind of feed a little bit into what I would say, which is it's, I think it is really important that Wimbledon have a manager that really connects with the sports mm. and can kind of bring that fire to, to life. Hopefully, Johnny Jackson can do that. All he think... needs to do is just show a bit more passion and he'll be fine. I think if he's, mm. if he, if, and it's even little things like his body posture, so come out in the interviews, bolt up if you're losing, own it, accept it. Um, I remember one thing that Lee Brown did, and whilst he's, a, I don't know why people don't like him at the moment, I think he's all right, but, um, I think there was, like you've mentioned, there some behavioural conduct issues and stuff, but uh, that doesn't bother me um, at the moment. It's not an issue. If it, in, if it seeps into on the pitch and sort of poor teamwork, but it doesn't sound like there's any sort of issues within the squad and stuff. They sound like they're all, like the team look on so like on the, you see the training ground videos and stuff. The team seem more cohesive than ever. So, um, like a huge shout out to Chris Fort for that because the content we do is really good now. Um, and yeah. I think that's really good of insight into, into the club. Um, yeah, I, did, I, that job. I just... Lee Brown came out in the interview and said, I think there's something like some of these players need to get their heads out of their asses and sort of cover it. That's not really swear, is it? But that's what he said. So, okay. uh, yeah, uh, get their heads out of somewhere. Uh, okay. and, uh, we'll, and, leave, we'll leave that to the imagination. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can edit that bit out. Uh, sort of get their heads out of somewhere and sort of really own it. And he really mm. came out and said, Look, we need to, the players need to sort themselves out and we're taking this. And that, that really scored him some points. And if Jackson came out and said, look, it's on us, we need to do better. And he is saying it, but he's not saying it like he means it. Mm. You know, like when you're in school and you have to apologise to like the teacher, you're like, oh, sorry. Like you're sort of quiet, you don't really say anything. You sound you like a person well. speaking from experience, Tom. No, not me. Never me. <laughs> <laughs> I was an absolutely model student. Um, oh, all right, that's good. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about uh, Jake Reeves, uh, Tom, yes. because I think that's a really good signing. I think he's going to bring a lot We've just signed someone that's been promoted. That's incredible. We've yeah. taken someone from a promotion win inside and put him into our team. And and I'm not going to lie to you, I, I didn't watch much of Stephen. It's obviously understandably being a team fan of a team in the same division. I was watching my team, but sure. I don't know what you saw of him if you did watch much of him this year. Yeah, no, I think um, I think Stephen would have liked to have kept Jake Reeves. I think mm-hmm. it was location that was the reason why he he moved on rather than rather than ability. It's not like he was released. I think he was offered a new deal. Um, so yeah, and I think he'll bring a lot of quality. I think he's shown uh, Wimbledon were obviously a very functional, hard working side and fitted into that but also offered them a bit of um a bit of quality on the ball gave, mm-hmm. gave them a bit of oxygen sometimes and maybe he could be a bit of a solution to what we were talking about earlier which is when the ball goes into midfield yeah. is jake reeves going to be the one that actually looks after it a little bit more i don't know i don't know if alex woodyard can necessarily do that kind of job i don't know alex if woodyard is a ball winning midfielder he breaks play up and plays a pass and that mm-hmm. unfortunately that is all he can do like as much i love him i think he's a great player but there's quite, there was quite a lot of times at the start of our League One campaign we got relegated. We had sort of Aaron Presley, Luke McCormick, sort of running through, making these great runs, like ex-Premier League players who know what they're doing. 
and he's running with his head down, running down, running, 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 looks up. Oh, they run their offside, plays the ball offside. And then it's not him that's getting the blame. It was the you know, the, the 19 year olds that we had <laughs> on loan. And I thought that was a bit harsh um, on, on them. Yeah. But Alex Woodrow is, is a good ball winning midfielder. Let him get the ball, play a quick pass, his job's done. And he covers the pitch when he's fit, not when he's playing every single possible minute available to him, which I just... I just well, well, that's, well, that's where, where you know, why would you keep Bendel as part of the squad just to rotate with Alex if, as I said, if we don't get any, any more names in, which I'm hoping we do, um, I'm hoping we do. I, I, I've heard a rumour of Luke McCormick coming back, but I just can't see it happening because no one, none of our fans like him, apparently. I think he's all right. I think he's a good player. I think but... he's a pretty technical player, you know. I, I gen... Watching him was a genuine like joy to watch. He was great on the ball. Um mm. And he scored a 90th minute equalise against Burton, which I will live on forever because that was a great goal. Um, but and I remember he, he ran like 40 yards to slide tackle some player off the ball, which I thought was also just like that is Wimbledon, isn't it? That is Wimbledon through and through. <laughs> but the way he left, and, and again, he was sort of villainized when he left. Um, but that's against the point. If we can get someone like him in, then Bendel goes or like a. Did, did type, I mean, is Ben is Bendel going to play more advanced? Or well, I, I was always told he was sort of like an attacking midfielder that can play a killer pass or like not attacking, sorry, but sort of like. Sitting just in front of an Alex Woodyard, sort of maybe like a Jake Reeves, that sort of role. Whereas Alex Woodyard is your, your typical defensive midfielder, sort of tackling players, kicking up mm. in the air, getting the ball, and playing it off. Right, I, he's I, I, I wasn't have an understudy for then. I don't know if there's anyone in the current squad who could do that. No, I I, I agree, and I just don't know where we let George Marsh go unless he was asking for too much money. George Marsh was an Alex Woodyard replacement, like he they were the same player, and George Marsh could play a pass. He was. He he played against Brad. He played one full game, I think, and he played against Bradford last year, who were one of the better teams in the division, you'd say. Bradford were decent. They he was unbelievable stepping in cold as well. Like he not played for a while. He stepped in, bossed the midfield, and we've let him go. I just, but I do think Craig Cope is really, really strict on like he if if he if we offer player money, and they say no. He goes, well, see you later, then, sort of thing. Like it's mm. there's no there's no messing around. And I think I, you've I, got to I be like that. that you know, I like from... that. It's good because yeah. in in the past we've we've given some interest in like a three year deal for Quezia Pyre that is pff, barbaric, especially when we were like we were... you've got to you've got to hold your own in the negotiations and if the deal's yes. not right you don't go for it. And um, also with Craig Cope's book uh, recruitment book, I'm assuming that he'll if, if someone says no he'll go right I'll go get someone else then like you sort of thing because yeah. he he knows non league apparently again never spoke never said a word to the man but. I'm not not against talking to him, but I just never, <laughs> never met him. So, uh, yeah. But uh, by the sound of things and what I'm hearing, he, he seems to know his stuff. So that's all I can ask for. As you know, I shot head of football. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what was I gonna... Oh yeah, who's coming through the academy at the moment? Uh, any, so, any Morgan other? Williams uh, and Aaron Sassu and Paris Lock have all just signed pro deals. Uh, very okay. very exciting players. Aaron Sassu apparently, again, I'm going off people who watched him in the youth cup games. He's like a six, apparently six foot three winger, which is incredible. So I'm happy with that quite fast as well, which is always nice. Um, Do you think you're playing with then, wingers this season? Well, again, this McLean and and um, Nerfil signings making me think we're going to have a maybe a backup system, which is whew, that is this is new Wimbledon if we've got a secondary system. Like, this is going to be incredible. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe we will. I, it, or it could be sort of a four four two, and you play sort of out out far out wide or. We play them somewhere out of position, which is never, you know, against what Wimbledon do. Um, but their players to come through, sort of maybe get minutes this season. Um, and then other players, I think Ethan Sutcliffe is a very good centre-back coming through. Interesting. Uh, but again, I think we let a lot of our youngsters go, actually. Um, yeah. we only offered, in previous years, you've got quite a good academy going through. Yeah, but I think we kind of took the creek at the top level and then said to the others, look, we yeah, probably haven't got the money to kind of give them pro deals. Or look, try and go and get sort of better options in sort of National League or National League South, North, that sort of thing, where you can kind of have a better pathway in. I yeah. think it's been a bit ruthless this year, which I'm not against because I'd rather us, us not keep someone on just for the sake of it. Sure. But we might as well just say, because I don't think we've got a 21s or 23s. I think we've only got an 18s. Well, it's, we it's a heavily loan-led policy. You've had, you've sent like 10 players out on yeah. to non-league and I see 15 even, you know, it's a yeah, lot yeah. Um, which obviously everyone I always slate Chelsea for, but you know I think we we're slightly different. We, I think we're hoovering up all the European elite talent. We just, <laughs> we're taking a few lads from Southwest London, uh, but yeah. So I, I, I'm happy with that if it get, means they're getting minutes. I think it is you do see sort of I think Alpha Bender would benefit from being you know 17, 18, playing in a 21 team, sort of getting that experience while still being sort of based at home, that sort of thing. Whilst he's again apparently he's very good, but I just haven't seen this from him on the pitch. He doesn't seem to make his tackles very well. Sometimes he misplaces passes and things like that. And it's just like everyone says he's like at most the world's greatest passer and things like that. He had a free kick last year. I think I think got a goal because put it into the box. But 
but it wasn't like I didn't look at him and go, "Wow, this is a play," right. sort of thing. So I, I'm hope and, and I'd never wish ill on any Wimbledon player for obvious reasons because I want them to make us as much money as possible and get us as many <laughs> points as possible. But I just don't think he he's there yet. Okay. But he turned 18 in January. Like he's 18. He's not even 18 and a half yet. Like mm-hmm. he's, he's not gonna he's not gonna be a finished article. Sure. So well, and I'm hoping we can see better of him this year. If not alone, then see him second half of the season. That'd be sort of the dream. Mm. So how many more additions do you think Wimbledon going to need that improve the fir- the quality of the first eleven? I think we need another centre back, okay. either for depth or, or or to walk into the first team. Um, and it depends on who goes, but on the current squad. Maybe a right back. Uh, although Ogundeh can play right uh, back. You wouldn't go with Hospitaler as first choice. No, no, no. Hospitaler's first choice, but like a rotationary option. So like a okay, player. yeah, sure. So I guess you've got Ogundeh who can play back up and there's no point in putting the next player on the wage. Yeah, centre back. And again, there's questions around our goalkeepers. Um, I don't know what's happening with Nick Zanev. I mean, I hope he stays, but I don't, I don't, I've not seen many training pictures and things like that. He's obviously been on duty with New Zealand, um, but hopefully he stays. Nathan Broom was good last year, but I think, again, he, 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 we'd need an experienced... Apparently, we were linked with Jamal Blackman, who was at Exeter. Because he wants to come Ooh, back to that'd London. That'd be quite a good signing. That'd for be a good team. signing, yeah. yeah. Uh, and also Ellery Balkum on loan from Brentford, who I'd be, I'd be very open to. Apparently, he's a he's a really solid keeper. He's done well in League One before. I mm. think he had a really good loan spell at Doncaster. Yeah, Bristol, or Doncaster. He was at Bristol as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he was at Bristol Rovers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I'd happy have him. Um, but again, if Nick Zanev's my number one next year, I've got that too. So maybe a centre back and then another midfielder, sort of. Whether that's an attacking midfielder or just between sort of is it like a six or an eight? I don't know which position. Six or eight, that's sort of like in the middle. Uh just to sort of <laughs> link with Jard and Tilly would be the dream. <laughs> okay, that'd be great. Yeah. Um you excited about the James Tilly signing? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good sign. We've paid for him out of his contract as well, which again, we don't we don't buy players, we get them on free. So <laughs> Craig Cope is working absolute wonders. Um but no, yeah, so James Tilly, he was very good for Crawley. I remember him being good against us, but again, only I only saw him in the two games against us. So I think he got an assist in when they beat us. Shock, they beat us. They're only mm-hmm. way winner the season. Um, but when when we played them, uh, there wasn't really any standout players like that made them look really good because I think that Crawley away game we were very very good as a whole team. Um, but when they came to us, he sort of set the goal. It was a good goal. They they went out, got their goal in six minutes, and defended like when they played mm-hmm. us, which which is what I expected them to do from minute one. Because they they they're not great on the road, but they weren't. They didn't win a game all season, apart from us. And yeah, and I remember him, him sort of drifting in that play, looking decent. I think he'll be an improvement on Ethan Chislett, who's obviously as as things stand, not under contract, because obviously we've offered him a deal. But I don't know where he'll go. I don't think he. I think he's a league Chislett's a league two player at the moment. He hits a good free kick, but I think the free kicks kind of give him an extra sort of level in terms of he did disappear in games a lot. But then again, are our attacking players disappearing because we're not actually getting them involved in play? Yeah, he's another issue. That could be where Jake Reeves comes in, so hopefully he can make a huge difference. Um, what would be the reasons, Tom, for... I've got to make my 1-24 to predictions in a few weeks, yeah. so I've got to predict predict Wimbledon. Um, what would be the reasons to be massively excited about Wimbledon and to be massively in favour of them really improving and kicking on from last year? Uh, Ali Alhamid is number one, getting a full season, hopefully a full season with us. Uh, and, and sort of, he's, he's introduced to the team now, he's, he's integrated. And then uh, him and Omar Bujil up front will be exciting for me. Um, our transfer window so far, again, massively exciting. Um, sort of bringing in players that we've, I don't think we've seen sort of a Jake Reeve signing, an experienced midfielder who's not like 35, you know, sort of pushing on. He's, he's in the, he's in sort of in his prime, he's only 28, 29. So, like, I'm happy with that. That's great. Uh, he's in a promoted team. He's going to come in, sort of. He'll probably be a, sort of a guiding head in that team as well, saying, "Look, boys, I know how to get promoted out of this division because I've done it. Done it. You've done it twice. Did you do it once in League Two? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, he's done it twice. So he's got a League Two twice. So he's probably one of the best players to go from that. Uh, and also looking at the experience of Alex Pierce and, and, and a mixture of experience and youth, I think it's going to be really good for us. And, and hopefully, the development of a lot of young, exciting players who, if played correctly and sort of in the right systems, will be very good. But it all depends yeah. on the management. And I think that would be... I imagine your next question is sort of, why would you not be excited? <laughs> yeah. You, you, yeah. And, and number one would unfortunately be the uh, be the man would be Johnny Jackson. And not anything against him. I just don't think last year worked very well. A lot of the fan base are already against him and, and negative going into next year. Um, I know someone that wasn't going to renew his season. He obviously has renewed his season. But he genuinely didn't come to games and stuff because he didn't want to watch Johnny Jackson's team. And look, fair play to him. He's, he's paying the money to come to a game. So look, if you, if you, if you don't like the management or the football, why are you going to come? Because it, and a lot of people, I think, did turn away. There was a lot of empty seats at the end of the season in terms of season ticket holders. Luckily, we were, we were getting walk-ups and stuff in because the attendance was still you know, between seven and seven and a half. 
Which, you know what, when we went from four and a half at Kings Meadow, is our capacity to now averaging seven, seven and a half. I'm happy with that. Um, and I just, I'm just hoping that we can, we can either make a swift managerial decision or give Jackson the sort of guidance that he needs. Um, and also, just, sorry, just to bring in ex- uh, another excitement, um, an old Wimbledon player, and I cannot remember his name for the life of me, um, is one of our new scouts. Is it Thorne? Andy Thorne? Andy, Andy Thorne. Thorne, that's it. Yeah, Andy Thorne. I nearly called him Alan Thorne, which would have been really embarrassing. Um, I knew it was A Thorne, but uh, yeah. And uh, again, he worked, he's worked at high levels and uh, a good um, clubs before, and he's good recruitment. I'm assuming that's probably why. Um, we're seeing some some good signings now because he's probably had a say in that. So there's definitely a lot of excitement, but I think it's very sort of in the balance whether it's actually going to be realised. But we're going to win the league, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that bombshell, um, such a such a pleasure to chat on with you, Tom. Um, absolutely love your stuff. Uh, just before I let you go, just talk to us about your plans for the Nine Years Podcast. Um, yeah. Um, next season so we do the pre-match show and the post-match show um and it, it's it's really good fun we, we've hopefully got a good, lot of good plans next year as well so it should be really exciting what we do uh we bring people on away fans players and we just chat uh, up to kickoff really um sort of giving our thoughts i don't think we've ever got a prediction right in terms of scores which is shock because we usually predict wins um and yeah it's good fun we sort of chat through and then at the end i have the pleasure of hosting the post-match show which i'm sure you can imagine after a 5-1 drubbing by swindon uh, is not the most fun place to be in the planet. So, yeah, uh, it's really good fun. We have uh, good chats and uh, we get a lot of players on. So if, if any Wimbledon fans or any other fans that if, if football clubs want to come on, uh, come and have a listen, have a chat with us, obviously, with, on YouTube um, and Facebook. So, obviously, we, we uh, chat to people in the comments and things like that as well. So come and have a watch, have a chat and, and watch us talk all things Wimbledon. Yeah, well, absolutely. Go check it out. Go follow uh, Tom at Tom Large Reports and go follow Nine Years Podcast as well. Um, This has been EFL Debate, the AFC Wimbledon Summer Deep Dive, and we'll see you again very soon.